be, I study the impossible. That's always been what I do. I study those yeah. moments in time when the impossible becomes possible. I think if, if you're hungry and you really want to work, just exploit your curiosity. Anything you're curious about, mm. you find a way to write about. And my specialty was those moments in time when science fiction became science fact. People don't like saying it out loud, but um, getting fucked up seems to have a use value to our species. So I always tell people, flow is romantic love plus three other chemicals. This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive, but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com so ladies and gentlemen it is my absolute honor to welcome to unstoppable today Stephen kotler Stephen, thank you so much for being here mate very good to be with you Mate, it's, uh, it's a huge pleasure. Now, I'm, I'm someone that's been obsessed for, with performance now. Uh, I'd, I'd say at a conscious level where I consciously have been pursuing strategies in the area of performance, it's got to be close to, yeah, I'd say 23 years now. And so for, for someone like myself who's a passionate student when it comes to learning about the aspects of performance, but more importantly, the, the real research and, and what goes behind it, when I, when I came across your work, mate, it was a real, yeah, it was a real eye-opener. But for when I look at what you've done, I look at who you've worked with, I look at all the books you've read, sorry, that you've written, I should say, uh, and you've probably forgotten more than you've read. But um, I, I always one think to myself, how would you answer this question? If you were sitting down at a dinner party and uh, there was a group of people, respectful people, who didn't know who you were, and they said, so Stephen, lovely to meet you. So what do you do, mate? How would you answer that question? Oh, that's easy. I study the impossible. That's always been what I do. I study those yeah. moments in time when the impossible becomes possible. Right, doesn't matter what domain, where you are, but that's what I've always done. My entire career has been spent on that single question. What does it take to do the impossible? And so what is the impossible? Well, I'm just, I'm interested, literally interested, uh, in the beginning it was literally, I was interested in those things that people said couldn't be done, that we literally right. called, and history, you know, this is not a big deal, right? History is littered with the impossible, but I was very fascinated. Uh, it, it started in, in sport, uh, in, in action sports more than anything else. But I took that question into business. I took it into science and technology. And I'll give you, technology is a really easy one. For uh, 25 years, I covered uh, technology for Wired, the New York Times Magazine, a whole bunch of other people as a journalist. And my specialty was those moments in time when science fiction became science fact. So I had a, you know, I had a list of 27 technologies that I was tracking. They were all, you know, impossible technologies that were not supposed to ever become reality. And the minute one would become reality, I was, I was there to kind of cover the story and try to figure out how the hell that happened. And so where did this all begin, mate? Did, did you always have an interest in the human side of performance or did it start on the technology side of performance? No, it's, I, there's a lot of different places it started. The, the, there's a, when I started out as a journalist in action sports, I was, I, I, yeah, I was covering everything, but I, it was, was the early 1990s. And back then in America, action sports, surfing, skiing, rock climbing, snowboarding, and the like were just becoming a hot topic. So if you were a journalist and you could write and ski or ride or surf or ride a rock climb or anything else like that, there was a tremendous amount of work. So I was covering technology, I was covering science, I was covering all these other things, but I was also covering action sports. And I, in the 1990s, for, for a lot of reasons that were sort of at the center of my book, The Rise of Superman, there was an unprecedented rise in the upper limits of human performance. And more kind of impossible feats were accomplished over about a 10 year period than ever before in history. And it caught my attention, not just because there were athletes doing impossible feats, that, that alone was amazing, but the athletes who were doing this, most of the people I knew who were involved uh, had very difficult childhoods. They came from, from rough backgrounds. A lot of them had very little money. They had a, very little education. And yet here they were on a like, semi-regular basis 
redefine the limits of our species. And that caught my attention, right? And I, and I tried to understand that. Um, and that question led me into other domains. So I, I, you know, I went out of action sports into, into science and technology and then eventually into business and other places like that. And so how did you get into action sports journalism in the first place? Like, is there a, a little bit of a, a thread here that goes all the way back to childhood? Yeah, you, I mean, I was, like a, I, was a, a, I was a, you know, I was a punk rock kid from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, punk at, at that time meant skating, skiing. You know what I mean? These were, those yeah. are in, in the, I'm old enough that like, you know, action sports were actually punk rock activities when I was a kid, right? <laughs> this was not mainstream athletics and, you know, uh, nobody had a sponsor or anything else like that. A lot of people had Mohawks though. Um, uh, so, you know, it was, a, it was a childhood interest. And really when I got uh, out of grad school, um, a couple things were really self-evident to me. One, uh, I looked very strange. I had long dreadlocks and earrings and uh, nobody was really going to give me a job in the mainstream corporate world. I had worked in advertising before. I had done some serious stuff, but nobody was going to really hire me because uh, I looked too weird for them. Uh, and I fell into magazine journalism. And it was really in the beginning, it was a way to pay my bills while I finished my first novel. I can't, I was I'm trained as a writer. Um, and I was a fiction writer and I was, that's what I was doing. And I was like, oh, I can't work in advertising, but I'm a writer. Let me sort of fall into j magazine journalism and, and journalism, uh, especially freelance writing. If, if you're hungry and you really want to work, you just exploit your curiosity. Anything you're curious about, mm -hmm. you find a way to write about. So for a guy like me, it was absolutely perfect. And it, you know, very quickly, I realized that you could get kind of a postgraduate education in almost any field you wanted mm. just by doing stories, right? Oh, you want to learn about neuroscience? Great. Write a story about Nobel laureates, things like that. I mean, the guys who originally taught me neuroscientists were some of the giants of neuroscience. Um, mm. And so things along those, those lines, but I, I took it everywhere, but I was a guy who liked action sports and I was really, um, I was just very attracted to all of it. Um, rock climbing, snowboard, it just was really, really interesting to me. Um, and I was also kind of aware that the limits of performance, it wasn't making a whole lot of sense. Even back then we talked about how, wow, the rate of progression seems really strange. It's got to stop. And that was a conversation that was very common among the journalisms. We journalists, we'd watch the progression and everybody was like, yeah, there's gotta be a limit. This is, this has gotta be the year there's, they're not going to add another flip. They're not going to add another twist. We're getting to the edge of what's physically possible. You can't jump by anything bigger. And it just never ended. It just kept going and going and going. And, and, you know, eventually you watch this enough times and you start asking, well, what the hell is going on? Why, how is mm. this possible? Um, and, you know, if it's possible for them, is it possible for me? Which was, you know, the other question also that everybody wants to figure out. And so then you you set off upon researching that 10 year period where you just saw that dr drastic elevation in performance across. No, the, the, the story gets sideways. Uh, I got very lucky and very unlucky at the same time. I, towards the end of my 20s, when I was 30 years old, I got Lyme disease spent the better portion of three years in bed and the, I was done. Like I couldn't walk across the room. I couldn't think I bankrupted myself. I lost everything you could possibly lose. And, uh, at the very end of it, uh, when the doctors had pulled me off medicines, nobody knew I was going to get any better. A friend of mine dragged me to the Pacific and forced me to go surfing basically. And I dropped when I went, so I, it was, they gave me a giant board. I could barely walk. They had to carry me out to the lineup. The whole thing was a farce. And I caught a wave and I popped up onto that wave and it was, I dropped into what I now know is an incredibly deep flow state. At the time, I don't even know if I knew the word flow. I might have, but this was time slowed down. I felt like I had panoramic vision, all these crazy things happened. And I felt great. That was the most amazing part is I like physically felt great, mentally felt great. And um, that wave felt so good. I caught like four more that day and they took me home and sort of put me into bed and I didn't move for like 14 days. And on the 15th day, I caught another ride back to the ocean and I had this very powerful altered state experience. And I kept doing this. And over the course of about eight months, I went from about 10% functional, meaning like I could think and be clear headed and pain free, like an hour a day, maybe to about 80% functional. And wow. I, I so I will a the question was, what the hell's going on, right? Like yeah. surfing is not a known cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. <laughs> so that was, that was problem yeah. A and problem B was, and this was the real issue I thought was Lyme is only fatal if it gets into your brain. Yeah. And 
I'm a science guy. I don't have panoramic vision. Time doesn't slow down. Like all the things that were happening to me in the waves, becoming one with the ocean, you know, these very strange quasi mystical feelings. I thought they were happening because the disease had gotten in my brain and it was killing me. So even though I was feeling better, I was pretty sure I was dying. So I lit out on a quest to figure out what the hell was happening to me. And I very quickly learned that uh, the states I was experiencing have a name. We call them flow states, right? There's a hundred and year 50 history of, of science and research into flow fading up to the 1870s. Though I don't think I discovered that at the time. But I very quickly discovered, because um, of work by a cardiologist at Harvard named Herbert Benson, who had done work on flow and map sort of the cycle of the experience and a couple other things. He has argued, we know uh, flow uh, among the other things that causes it, there's a huge neurochemical spike in the brain. Five different neurochemicals get pushed into the brain in, in higher concentrations than normal. And all five, they do a lot of performance enhancing stuff and that's primarily what we know them as, but they're all immune system boosters. And more importantly, as we move into flow, so Lyme disease, any autoimmune condition is a nervous system gone haywire. That's essentially what it is. And as you move into flow, there's a global release in the body of uh, nitrous oxide. There's a gases signaling molecules everywhere in the body, but it shows up as we move into flow and it pushes the stress hormones out of our system. It flushes them out and it replaces them with these feel good performance enhancing immune boosting neurochemicals. And by resetting a nervous system, just back to baseline, here's normal. That's a big deal. When your nervous system is really haywire, the body's a homostatic organism, but if it doesn't know where baseline is, which is what happens after a long autoimmune condition, it's very hard to get better. So Herb Benson has gone so far as to say he thinks this set of mechanisms is responsible for a great number of our so-called spontaneous healings, right? It's the actual, it's, it's the biology underneath what's actually going on. I don't know if that's the case. I, I do know what happened to me and, and in my case. And I very quickly, none of the illness healing stuff is important here. What's really important is I started to realize as I was looking at flow, the same state of consciousness that got me from seriously subpar back to normal was helping these athletes and the scientists and everybody else I was sort of studying go from normal all the way up to Superman. So it was the same, it was the same continuum. And that's what I mean by I got very, very lucky. I sort of like walked right into um, you know, flow is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. So it's the, basically the state that evolution created uh, even for peak performance, right? It's how it shaped mm. our brain and our bodies to perform at its best. And I just sort of, you know, the very question that I was trying to answer, the answer sort of like showed up very, very significantly in my life. So it was that confluence that brought it together. Is flow an individual thing or can everyone achieve flow the same way? So, um, flow is universal. It shows up in anyone, in anywhere, provided certain initial conditions are met. We'll come back yeah. to those in half a second. Um, so it's ubiquitous, right? Everybody okay. listening to this can get into flow. Everybody in the world can get in the flow. Um, it, it's just, it, it's part of our biology. It's part of our innate hardwiring. There are, uh, 22 different triggers for the state. These are preconditions that lead to more flow. And though the ones you are susceptible to can change. So what's individual, when we work with individuals, when we work with organizations, right? The biology is always the same. How it works is always the same. But what is going to work for you, that is very individual. Out of the, like it's a menu, right? Like these are the 22 mm -hmm. triggers depending on your personality, your nature, your nurture. And some of it gets really, you know, how reactive are your dopamine receptors in your brain and things like that it gets very, very specific. And we don't have phenomenal, we've got good research on the triggers that's building up, but how they relate to people individually, that's a level of mapping. The science isn't there yet. We just can't ask the questions. Quite is there yet. a significant link between flow and value systems? And um, obviously that, that, that psychological a, neurochemical link. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I have not worked on this, but I will tell you that Chris Peterson, who's a positive psychologist at the University of Michigan here in the States, and Martin Seligman, yeah. um, another positive psychologist, they worked on it a little bit. And um, so values are interesting. And Seligman and Peterson uh, wrote kind of a book on strengths and values. And what they have found is that you're in their system, their system, your yep. strengths align with your values 
And what they have found is that working in a way so that you're always working in and around your one to five of your core strengths will massively increase the amount of flow in your life. So there's, bless you. There's, you. Uh, there, there does appear to be, to be uh, some relationship there. And we do know from other work where they was sort of done at the Harvard Adult Development Project that exposure to flow states over time one of the things that it does is it uh, it expands perspective, forces you to see things from kind of a multi-perspectival type of way, and it increases empathy a little bit, and it expands actually our appreciation of nature. So those three things, depending on how you set your values, right? Yeah, um, yeah of course. Though those three things um, do increase over time with access to flow, but it's not sort of a guarantee, right? Otherwise. You'd, every surfer would be a Buddha, and that's clearly, you know, not the case. Obviously, <laughs> um, so there's a, there there are a bunch of uh, what psychologists basically talk about is if then clauses in there. You have to do the homework. You don't just get morality for free, in a sense. You have to sort of do the work along the way. Um, but there is correlation, and it's a great area of research. But when you yeah. once you take, once you sort of move up. Because values is right on the edge of what do we mean by culture and those kinds yeah. of things. And so I'll give you an, I'll give you a totally different example. Uh, if you're a fan of the history of peak performance, you know that most of the early uh, scientists who studied peak performance, and even a lot of the philosophers, but like from Nietzsche through William James, Freud talked about this young, they all said that you have to get past the limitations of, you know, to put it in Freudian terms, mommy and culture. Right. They basically said mommy and culture mm -hmm. weigh a lot. Right. And if you're interested yeah. in peak performance, you got to get past this. Now, I will yeah. tell you that we don't we don't live in Victorian England. Right. So we yeah. don't have our culture weighs less than it yes. weighed back then. Right. Yeah. And there's way more expression. You can be more of you. I can be more of me. Right. That's changed. But it does seem that like what you would mean by values, like there's some of that that get mixed into. And we know. Yeah. So I talked about flow triggers earlier, preconditions that lead to more flow. The most famous one is known as the challenge skills balance. Uh, I'm talking a lot to answer one question. So if you need Please, me to no. shut up, just tell no, me to shut going, up. Mate. All right. I can go forever. So <laughs> let, me, let me quickly give you a little uh, overview of what a flow trigger is, because it's easy to understand. Flow, uh, one of its core characteristics, one of its defining psychological characteristics, one of is, is that it only shows up when a bar of attention is focused in the right here, right now. Right when all yeah. your attention is focused on the task at hand, that's one of the ready conditions for flow. And we know that flow follows focus for that very reason. And we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of that task slightly exceeds our skill set. So you want to stretch but not snap. Right. This is one of flow's core triggers. If I were to talk about it emotionally, I would say that it this this balance mm. is not on, but right near the midpoint between boredom and anxiety. Boredom, yeah. there's not enough stimulation. I'm not paying enough, right? Anxiety, way too much stimulation. I'm paying too much attention. In between is this sweet spot. So starting, we've known about the challenge skills balance, we meaning the flow industry, flow, flow scientists, since Mihai Chicks at Mihai, uh, uh, sort of the godfather of flow psychology in the 1970s. He was at the University of Chicago, um, and he did some foundational work on this trigger, among some other a lot of other stuff. We've known about it for a really long time. Since the like 80s or 90s, psychologists have been screaming at each other over what the fuck do we mean by challenge and what do we mean by skills, and they dissect it a thousand different ways. But it's very clear that however we define those terms, challenge or skills, culture and our culture are, has something to do with it, right? If the challenge is physically difficult and you come from a very macho male culture, right, then that you, you have to view it as a lesser, right? That it, it changes the way you see it. It changes perception. It ends up impacting neurobiology and performance. So there's a lot of that stuff wrapped around your question as well. Um, it's yeah. a good. It's a good question. It's sort of the cutting edge of where we are and what we're poking yeah. at, and we don't know for 100. percent I wish I could give you a better answer. No, because I've always had this curiosity myself. You know, as a practitioner, um, probably more than a researcher, but certainly someone who who does a, a lot of research at the intersection between the psychology, you know, the physiology, the biology, and all the chemistry, and you know, how much control do we have when it comes to you know making sure that when that intersection clicks. 
you know, that everything's firing in the right direction. I am curious to know, though, because, you know, you, you've, you've probably I've been asked every single question under the sun when it comes to performance, because what we know um, unequiv unequivocally is that flow and performance are intrinsically linked. High levels of performance are uh, intrinsically linked with high levels of flow, which is this miraculous state that has this ability not just to give us access to levels of performance, but also by sounds also has this ability to, to spontaneously heal the body at the same time. Potentially, potentially. potentially. <laughs> there's I mean, immune markers. There's immune markers. No, right. I mean, there's well, a talk, lot. I'm not, I'm not referring lot. to limes. I'm talking the immune markers that you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah. So when we talk about flow, and I'll and I'll back this off and explain it. Flow. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about flow impacting performance, um, it impacts. It's a on the like on the physical side, for example, it increases strength, stamina and decreases pain response, increases fast twitch muscle response. So that's just on the physical side. On the mental side, we see gains in motivation, productivity, creativity and innovation, accelerated learning, uh, cooperation, collaboration, communication, empathy and environmental awareness. And the next, if you are a critical thinker at all, the next question you gotta ask is, what the hell with that list of like, why those things, right? And the yeah. answer is actually interesting. Um, the answer is evolution. And so evolution is what shaped our brain. And evolution is essentially designed to react against scarcity, right? Scarcity of resources is the main driver of evolution. And there are two responses to scarce resources. You can fight over dwindling resources, or you can get creative, co collaborative, cooperative, and innovative and make new resources. So everything that flow amplifies is all the stuff you need either to fight or flee, depending on which side of that experiment you want to be on, or create, innovate, and make new resources. So that's that's why it's this whole big, weird suite that doesn't make any sense until you put that on top of it and you're like, oh, I get it. Yeah. But one thing I'm hearing consistently is this 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 moment where there's this moment in time, there's this level of attention, and it, it almost appears like we're talking about aspects of <clears throat> almost like what pop pop spirituality in terms of the mindfulness that's required or the level of consciousness that might be required to amplify flow state. So I guess the question that rolls around in my head as a practitioner as well is how much does like uh, consciousness or self-awareness actually impact our own ability to be able to selectively enter flow states? Consciousness is a harder question to answer. Um, so let's just push that aside for a second. <laughs> um, we'll come back. Maybe we'll work we'll our way back, back, back to it. Yeah, we'll maybe work our way back there. Um, but when self, I refer to consciousness, yeah, self, I refer to a level of awareness. Yeah, a level no, self-awareness self -awareness is, so there's a mindful, so we can, Let's come back to mindfulness too. Let's just start yeah. really simply with self-awareness. Okay. Um, certainly, you have to you have to have self-awareness is is sort of foundational if you really want to do long-term. It's not foundational for getting into flow. I can teach you the triggers, right? right. I can okay. teach you how the flow cycle works. I can teach you sort of how the triggers works, and you will be I able to use them to get into flow. But you won't be able to stay there for long, yeah. you won't be able to really blow up the state because you really have to have a lot of internal understanding. And if you're interested in a high flow lifestyle, for example, there's a lot of, you need a lot of all the EQ, all the emotional intelligence skills, self-awareness, self-management, emotional awareness, emotional management, management, you know, all the other people, you, those are all sort of really foundational. Mindfulness, so, there's a difference when you look at the brains of people who are meditating versus the brains of people who are in flow. They're similar. The different, so in both states, lots of things change. One of the things that happens is the activity in the prefrontal cortex, the front of your brain, that does your higher cognitive functions, um, gets really quiet in both. Your sense of self is there, your sense of morality, willpower, logical decision making gets very quiet in meditation and flow, this portion of the brain sort of shuts down in meditation, you almost turn it off completely because you're trying to get rid of the self and let go of all that inflow. Almost all the prefrontal cortex turns off, except for the very center of your brain, the medial prefrontal cortex, the medial orbital. Um, and you see a spike of activation there. And that's among many other things, creative self-expression. 
So flow is creative self-expression sort of turned to maximum. So this part of your brain, meditation, you're trying to forget the self. You don't, it's not an action state. It's a pat, it's more, it's not a passive state because you're you're doing something. But in flow, it's a decision-making state. Your flow is called flow because every decision, every action mm -hmm. seems to flow effortlessly, seamlessly from the last, right? And that's that uh, that's why the term is called flow, right? This is a sort of phenomenological description of how the state makes us feel. But it's really like high speed decision making that we're looking at. And that's just not prevalent in mindfulness, that you're not doing that in mindfulness, but you are doing it in flow. So is there such a thing as uh, hyper levels of flow? Because it seems to me like there's the, the, the flow is a spectrum. Yep. And depending on your self-awareness, self-understanding of triggers and everything else would determine not only your ability to get on the spectrum, but potentially how long you stay there, but also how far up you potentially go when it turns to function. So you are right about the spectrum. That we could, that when psychologists define flow, they define it by, by the presence of six core characteristics, complete concentration of the present moment, uh, time dilation, which is time passing strangely, it slows down or it speeds up. The common example is, you know, five hours pass by in like five minutes. You get in a great conversation with your, with your best friend, right? Two hours go by and you're like, what the hell happened, right? That's a, when that happens, that's a low grade flow state known as micro flow. And it's, so there are these six characteristics of flow. Microflow is when they, they all might show up, but their turn really don't dial down really slightly. And then macro flow is when everything shows up all at once. That's what happened to me with Lyme. And until like the 1950s, macro flow was essentially thought of as a spiritual or mystical experience. And it wasn't until the 1950s that we started to realize this had nothing to do with spirituality or anything else like that. It was a biological right. experience. Um, but it, macro flow is, is, is often mistaken for so-called mystical experiences because it's that, you know, super powerful. And to answer your second question, knowledge of the flow triggers is really what will turn a micro flow state into a macro flow state. Self-awareness is useful along the way for that. Um, I don't know if it's the end all be all. And, and when I say that it's with, like, I don't know how you would measure self-awareness. We don't yeah. have, I mean, we, right. We have, we have sort of psychological squishy. I can give you a, a survey kind of thing, but yeah. how do you really measure self-awareness um, is an, is an open question. So I don't know. I wouldn't know how to prove a negative. As a science guy, right. The first thing yeah. I want to do is right. How do I prove that? How do I prove, you know, the opposite of what you're saying? Um, and if it's not possible, then I can't prove what you're saying. And I, so that's like, we talk about, a lot of the psychologists who work for me um, are really big about talking about radical self-awareness is, is really important to this work. Um, and certainly mindfulness is a good tool for that because you get to watch yourself think. Right? There's a lot of there's a lot of tools out there that help develop self-awareness. I find um, this is complicated, but if you uh, if you can recognize individual neurochemicals in your own system, if you know what mm -hmm. dopamine feels like, if you know what norepinephrine yeah. feels like, if you know what ser that's incredibly useful for flow work. Because then I can just talk to you about mechanism and you know yeah. what, right? You don't, we don't have to talk about the squishy emotions that differ yeah, right. from individual to individual. On top of it, if you rec, for example, norepinephrine reads as anxiety and excitement, right? Same neuro, same signal different thing depending on who you are your frames your mentalities all that stuff but if i can get you to recognize what norepinephrine feels like first of all i can teach you to turn anxiety into excitement very easily mm. um but right you it starts to you can i can start doing more stuff that way and that's always a double-edged sword because you know the people who are good at that people who have done lots of drugs are usually the people who know what how neurochemicals are <laughs> what they feel like right i can't do that with clients you know, <laughs> I could, you know, we trade up a lot of people from Accenture, for example. I could see how that meeting is going to go, right? <laughs> well, okay, we have to start with the white powders today, people. You know, that's not going to work. So, but I, you know, I do, I actually do find that people who have, who have that in their past have sort of an easier time. Um, not self-awareness is self-awareness. Anybody can, anybody can learn that, but learning to recognize yeah. the individual sensations, you know. But there's a it's lot so of other ways. I've never it. heard someone talk to that. I've often thought about it with, you know, my own 
practices of recognizing. I don't think, yeah, I don't think anyone wants to say it out loud, but it's yeah. Uh, oh, you just gave me a massive level of comfort. Um, but you also kind of open up the door when it comes to transmutation or transcending from one state into another state. Um, you know, I think it was Napoleon Hill. I don't know if you've read Think and Grow Rich. I read that book, gosh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. And it was written by Napoleon Hill, who, you know, studied the 500 wealthiest people at that time. And he looked for all their characteristics and all their traits. And, you know, Andrew Carnegie gave him access to the 500 wealthiest men. He, he interviewed them all over 27 years and he came up with their, the 13 traits. And one of them was the power of sex transmutation. We identified all 500 had very high sex drives uh, and were very sexual in nature. But what they did is they focused that sexual energy into conquests for the person that was driving that, uh, that behavior, which is in most cases a woman or a female form. And Napoleon refers to it as that transmutation where he was taking one energy and he was turning it into another form of energy. And I know this is quite metaphoric in its example, but what, I, what it kind of sent me on was this ability to really start looking at you know, how we use different energies and how they can be transmuted into other states within the body. Uh, and I'm curious from your perspective, you know, is, is, is it possible, because you almost even led to it then, to take anger as an example or excitement as an example and then be able to consciously regulate it and actually transcend it into a flow state so that those chemicals don't necessarily get lost in the sea of just unconscious response? So you're asking a much more complicated... So I was referring specifically to a study done at Harvard Okay, I'm going way too far. No, no, it's okay because we can go there. But we'll start here because it's worth a damn. Harvard, these, these, so they were looking at cognitive reframing. So right. nor uh, anxiety in your system yes. is norepinephrine, right, which is noradrenaline. It's the brain's version of adrenaline. A little bit of cortisol this, and the stress hormone, right? That's what anxiety is. What is excitement? It is a little bit of cortisol and it is norepinephrine. So they at Harvard, they, they asked this question, how does, if, we, if I want to calm you down, am I better off using uh, breath, respiration, mindfulness, uh, like a parasympathetic, sympathetic balancing breath, five seconds inhale, five second exhale kind of thing um, for X amount of minutes or cognitive reframing. And so the test they ran is they literally had People feel their anxiety and say out loud, I am excited, I am excited, I am excited three times in a row. And they tested this against mindfulness and reframing work. It works in like seven seconds. You can try it yourself. You just have wow. to literally feel the anxiety and then I am excited, I am excited, I'm excited. You can take it a little farther. We, we do it. Uh, there's, there's ways to do it better. I mean, there's a lot of work around reframing. Um, it's very powerful. It's very crucial in peak performance. It's really crucial uh, for flow work as well. But this is what they were looking at, right? Um, and when you, the only thing I can tell you about anything that you said to me is <laughs> sexual energy is dopamine, right? When yep. you're talking about that, you're just talking about dopamine. Dopamine is also creative energy, right? Mm -hmm. When when dopamine is in our system, the brain finds faster connections between ideas, pattern recognition goes up. So that you, you like that big dopamine spike you get from the thrill of the chase will certainly drive innovation, right? It's, it's meant to drive the consequence. It's to, yes. consequence, right? It's meant to allow you to innovate your way into bed with that sexual opportunities you can procreate because that's our, our hard wiring, but you can take that same innovation and go use it for your company instead, mm -hmm. right? Like you could definitely do all that stuff. For sure. So there is such a thing as sexually charged flow. <laughs> well, there, are we going to see a book on it, or there's a lot. Well, there's been a lot of work on the similarities and differences between orgasm and flow because there's yeah, right. neurochemically and the the sexual experience before orgasm is very flowy, right? You lose track of yeah. time. You sense yeah. of self disappears. So a lot yeah. of there seem to be different, slightly different things going on, and certainly. In orgasm, when you actually, uh, orgasm self totally goes away. Like you vanish for a little while. That doesn't happen exactly the same way in flow. Like if you were riding a mountain bike down a mountain and you had an orgasm, you'd have a problem, 
Right. <laughs> right. The bike. I don't know. You I know. just go riding my mountain bike a lot more. That's the only problem. <laughs> I really <laughs> like this sport. It's so good. It's awesome. Downhill mountain biking. Who knew? <laughs> okay um, getting a little fuzzy <laughs> so right now there's you've got military you've got government you've got big businesses investing big bucks now into into flow research into flow technology uh to understand but also to execute in the flow space and like it seems pretty obvious on one hand to go the reason there's this level of interest is because you know obviously flow is about performance heightened flow heightened performance but it also seems to lend that there's also a big argument when it comes to efficiency as well. Because one of the things that I've noticed is the more routines that I have set up around me, the less decision fatigue that I actually engage in and the more efficient I actually am. So I have, you know, uh, 10 of the same color shirt. I have, you know, five pairs of the same jeans, 30 pairs of the same underwear, socks and everything else. And so every morning, you know, I find myself with these little routines far more efficient. Where does the argument lie or is it in both camps because of the value that you're starting to see come through is it in the area of performance or is efficiency also a big factor as well so i too am a fan i like you you'll i'm you see me in a black long t-shirt a black sweatshirt <laughs> a black button down a black suit like you know what i do the same thing um so this is this is there's like four different answers to your questions but i'll start with the coolest one uh i okay. think which is I love for this. So we talked earlier about flow triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. If I peel back the hood on what's the neurobiology, what happens in the brain with these triggers, they do one of three things. They either drive norepinephrine and dopamine into the brain. These are, we just talked a little bit about norepinephrine. One thing to know that neurochemicals are multi-tools. They do a bunch of different shit in the brain. So when you say norepinephrine is anxiety, well, it's also accelerated learning and about 17 other things, right? So yeah, right. They're, they're, one of the things that norepinephrine and dopamine do is they drive focus into the present moment. They massively heighten attention. Uh, we feel that as excitement, right? When they're in our system, we have a really easy, we have a hard time not paying attention to the thing that's in front of us in a sense. Or, and this is where we get back to what you just said, they lower cognitive load. Cognitive load is all the crap, decision fatigue, it's all the crap you're trying to think about at any one time. And if I lower cognitive load, I liberate more energy for focus and attention, and that mm. massively drives flow. So anything that you're talking about in terms of decision fatigue and that sort of stuff absolutely is useful for flow. And, you know, in, on the training side of this, this could mean everything from um, a clear goals list, a to-do list for your day, right, is a massive way to lower cognitive load, knowing what you're going to wear, right, ahead of time and, and, you know, doing those things. If you got to want to go to the gym first thing in the morning, set up your shoes the night before so you don't even, right, you want to minimize the friction between the thing that you're trying to do and yourself. All those things are, are very useful um, and I, you know, in terms of flow and uh, efficiency itself, you know, one of the things that that flow does is it massively increases productivity, right? And when I say massively, McKinsey executives at McKinsey did a ten year study, uh, and they found top executives were reported being five hundred percent more productive in flow. It's a massive spike in. Mm -hmm. That's, by the way, I mean, you wanted, why is there so much interest right now in flow? That's the reason. Because if you've been studying peak performance for a long time, you will know that a, a good self-help program, for example, is I can get a 5% increase in your life in whatever category you're looking for, 5% productivity or whatever, and I can get it to stick for three months. I got a million dollar business right there. But flow is a step function. It's a 500% boost in productivity and motivation. Learning, this is work done by the US Department of Defense, goes up 240%. Uh, there's uh, great creativity research that was done in, in your country, the University of Sydney, that shows that creativity will spike some 500% in flow, creativity and innovation. These are huge, huge, because the system is designed to work this way. You're just, you know, you have to think about flow as like, flow was designed to get you, those critical life-saving moments when the tiger jumps out of the bush or you're trying to run down your prey, that's sort of what it evolved for. So um, we're in, in those situations, you need a massive boost in performance. That's the system. Those are the systems we're sort of leveraging for flow. 
Um, and it's a huge step functions worth of change. And that seems to be the reason for all the interest. And a part of it, as you pointed out, is, is lowering cognitive load and, and having more efficiency. But what you gain so much efficiency, you get mm. time back, right? That's what accelerated we, learning and things like that give you. But how important is that to obviously you, there's much less cognitive load and maybe even physical load, or actually maybe more. But I'm curious to know when it comes to one of those triggers, if this is a trigger or more importantly, an environment, when it comes to setting ourselves up to be successful when it comes to entering more flow states, how important is self care, uh, rest and recovery when it comes to being able to be able to access those flow states more readily? Okay, I don't actually know what you mean when you say the term self care, but rest and recovery is. <laughs> I have no idea what self care means. Right, that could, that could mean anything. Really. I don't. It could mean anything. Well I don't. Know. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, anything that is even vaguely new age, you can see that I run the other direction immediately. <laughs> yeah. That's all I do. Oh, um, self care. Uh, is that the? Is that I don't know what that means. I don't, yeah, I don't know what that exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, here's what we know, and. Uh, this is Herb Benson, who we mentioned earlier. He was the first person to figure this out. We used to think flow was a binary state of affairs. You're either in the zone or you're out of the zone. And we now know that's not true at all. And it's actually a four-stage cycle. And you have to move through all state, all four stages before you can re-enter flow. And on the back end of a flow state, after you come out of flow, there's a deep recovery period. And this is critical for a couple, three different reasons. Um, the first is that flow is accelerated learning, but if you really want uh, those skills, the skills you acquired in flow and the stuff you learned in flow to stick long term, you need deep delta wave sleep on the back end. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the brain can't take move stuff from short term holding into long term storage. It's one of the things that happens in sleep, right? We encode memories. It's where the learning actually gets baked in. Also, flow is, and I think you alluded to this a second ago. It's an expensive state. It's a high energy state. It feels mm. really great. And it doesn't feel like we're burning massive amounts of calories. We're burning massive amounts of calories. And mm. we're the, the, all those neurochemicals that are in our system, it's a big push. So it takes a little while for us to rebuild some of those things. And some of them, for example, serotonin, which shows up at the back end of a flow state, that needs sunlight. That needs tryptophan in certain foods and things like that. So there's a, there's a recovery state on the back and, and for really maximizing flow, it's not just deep sleep. You need an active recovery protocol, right? Passive recovery is television and a beer. And that's not actually recovery. It's fake recovery. You think it feels like recovery, but your body isn't recovering at all. We can talk about why if you want to, but, uh, mm -hmm. um, active recovery is everything from like Epsom salts baths to like restorative yoga, not really vigorous, crazy. You're just trying to stretch it out and breathe. Mindfulness is an active recovery. Well, I love infrared saunas. I think they're really, I like to combine mindfulness and infrared saunas because you get alter That's benefits great. at once. Yeah, yeah. It's a great combination. Um, so, you know, I mean, those kinds of things I think are really key. And I also think um, Rian likes to say, and I, and I, and I tend to agree with him, um, though I think we need more research on this, um, that if you have an active recovery protocol in place, it's very hard uh, to sort of burn out, right? Executive burnout, especially among peak performers. I'm sure it's true uh, in, in, among your listeners as well. Peak performers burn out, right? They go too mm -hmm. hard and they burn out. And one of the things for sure, if you, ha if you have a regular flow practice, flow is seeping into your life on a regular basis, and you have an active recovery protocol in place, we don't think you can burn out. We think it, we don't know if it's 100% if you completely burn out proof, but you are so you're much more anti-fragile, much more resilient um, for a lot of different reasons. So w often you refer to flow as an altered state. <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, you did for me when I read uh, Stealing Fire is you kind of pushed me onto my own third wave. I, and I'd uh, played with psychedelics, you know, a lot in my uh, in my youth, never looked at them from a performance perspective unless it was performance on the dance floor. Uh, until I read your book. And then when I read your book, it literally set me off on this. <clears throat> I wasn't one of those people, by the way, that read the book and was like, oh my God, I need to find myself some LSD and start microdosing. It literally set me off where I, oh, I went God. and I, <laughs> where, well, I went and started I'm, studying. <laughs> you have to Go understand ahead. that like, I'm not a huge psychedelic fan. 
And I really <laughs> I know. can't stand psychedelic culture. I can't stand it, right? If one more kid in a funny hat wants to perform a cacao <laughs> ceremony and share sacred ayahuasca, I'm going to beat somebody to death, okay? <laughs> Let's just say if I make it to the end of my life without killing a millennial, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and he'll be wearing uh, psychedelic colors. Oh, um, no, please. Um, but, but yes. Well, what's interesting is you did push me down a very academic path. Like I went straight into Fatter Man's work and, and you know, oh, uh, uh, you know, all the way back to, um, uh, gosh, yeah, I, I went through everything. But, well, not everything. I went through a great deal of research. I spent uh, at least 18 months, almost two years of research before I myself studied, started um having a practitioner experience with, you know, microdosing of psilocybin, microdosing of LSD, uh, and even having entheogenic high dose, uh, entheogenic treatments. Uh, and just so you know, oh, and this is something I probably should thank you for. Uh, I've ha I had a uh, high level PTSD, like I'm talking high response PTSD for about 25 years. And, um, as a result of reading stealing fire, doing an immense amount of research and finding some people that could support me through the process. Yeah, I did uh, two high dose entheogenic backed up with some MDMA talk therapy, uh, and I have not had one PTSD That's activation great. since, and it's been over That's eighteen great. months now. Yeah, and that um, I, that that I definitely that to me is is the the massive benefit of psychedelics oh. on the on the healing side. They're a phenomenal phenomenal tool, and my problem with them on the performance enhancement side is not that I don't like Fadiman's work. Everybody's work clearly shows that these tools are very good for stimulating creativity. But I always, so at the Flow Research Collective, we have a rule, ironclad. And the rule is insight, research, communication, publication, communication, meaning have your insight, do your research, then publish on your research so other people can have the argument with you. And then you're allowed to get up on stage and talk about it, right? Gotcha. You don't, if, if you don't go in that order, you don't have any credibility as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the problem is I, what happens, people take psychedelics, they have insights and they think, oh my God, I had insights, I should go home and change my life on Monday or I should, no, no, you had an insight, you should do what you did, <laughs> two years worth of research, dig your <laughs> shit out, learn stuff. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. like, I, you know, you meet these people. I went to Burning Man. I had this experience. I went home and I divorced my wife. You did what? Wow. You quit your, like, that's just, we got a word for that. It's not a good word. <laughs> but, it's, but you, you've got to admit, and I, I was quite taken aback when I started microdosing with LSD and psilocybin, both had very different performance outputs for me personally. Um, but it was, it was hard to escape the fact that when I was, microdosing specifically with LSD that I was finding myself dropping into flow states a lot more easily, a lot more readily. But I, I guess my question would be is number one, you've got something to say, but number two, is there a consequence to that? You know, Cause oftentimes we look at drugs as yes, they might give us a short term access, but is there also an equal and opposite downside of that in terms of a depletion? So um, one, I am the wrong guy to ask. I really like, I, I left my old company. I started the Flow Research Collective because I don't want to work on psychedelics. Got I it. don't care. I, and, and let me, let, <laughs> let, let me put it to you how I, this is how I, te yeah. this is how I teach it. So I, I came up as a journalist and yeah. as you know, and I, I, you know, besides covering action sports, I covered heavy stuff. So I, over the course of my career in journalism, I was shot at on five separate occasions at no point when somebody was firing a gun at me, could I be like, hey, excuse me, sir, would you mind putting down the gun while I take this substance and we can wait 20 minutes for it to kick in so I can perform in my, right? Or can I use this technology? <laughs> That's just not how it works, right? In the okay. real world, you, you have to perform at your best, you know, sometimes. And so that I'm interested in flow because it's, I don't want to have to reach for a tool. I don't want to have to reach for a substance. I want to be able to reach for my own biology. Mm. Um, is my personal feeling on it, which is not to say these are not, these tools have been enormously useful to a lot of people, yourself included, and they're powerful and they're, they're cool. Uh, and, but the, the other thing is I also think they get, like people don't like saying it out loud, but um, getting fucked up seems to have a use value to our species. 
what happens in every bar on every Friday night, right? We work our asses off all week long and we go get wrecked, right? We don't just do that. There's a reason people do this. And so I often say that the value of psychedelic, like people want to turn them into something that they're not. I'm like, drugs are okay. If you're wired that way, like if you want to go get blotto on drugs, great, do that. That seems shutting it up for a little while is can be helpful for sure. And however you want to do that, I don't care or judge or, you know, don't, don't, don't wreck yourself. But I will beat you to death with a fucking don't, pickaxe. If don't, you come don't and wreck yourself. Story yeah, you. seriously, I will. I totally will. I will. Um, you're funny. Um, but uh, I'm glad this is area in Australia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, and I, but I actually want to answer your question more seriously, uh, which is, is there an upper limit? I don't know if there's an upper limit to the microdosing stuff. Um, certainly, uh, it seems like, I guess you could get into, you, you can really have, like you think, I was, when I stopped and paused and thought about like startups as you're moving towards like launch, right? When your whole team's, so every time you go to work, you're in group flow as you sort of get up to launch, right? And there's a lot, every time you check in, there's a tremendous, so you can be in flow all the time. Is that much different from microdosing for two months at a time? I don't know, but I do know that like, there's a point that you tend to burn out on the flow. So I'm guessing there's going to be a point mm -hmm. where you burn out on microdosing. I would say, I think like there's, there's giant experiments being run on this very question, right? All over yeah. the world right now, people have really taken to microdosing. And it's funny because I have found, um, I will of course try anything. Um, and I found microdosing um, not useful. It's not like it makes me grumpy. Actually, it doesn't yeah, right. produce. It doesn't produce flow for me. It doesn't. So the, I think people are wired very, very differently, and it's very, very individual. Um, it's. Uh, I think LSD is is a was a better experience for me than mushrooms. Mushrooms was I was just cranky. I was just mean. And I didn't feel creative. I felt like I wanted to crawl into a hole. Like I really didn't yeah, like, I didn't like that experience at all. Microdosing with, um, and I did it twice. Cause I didn't, I was like, there's no way I, I had to do it wrong. It was so miserable. <laughs> I did it again. Right. Like a couple of days later, I was like, I got to run the experiment again. Cause people love this. And I was like, no, no, this makes me feel awful on there. This is a idea. But, uh, yeah. So I think it's, I do think it's very, I do think it's very individual, but I think you're probably right that there's gotta be, you, you know, cycle on, cycle off, that sort of stuff. But we're seeing, we're going to get data one way or another, right, on, on can you do this stuff for years? I'm sure mm -hmm. there are psychologies uh, that could handle it, but. Yeah, it's interesting because I found uh, psilocybin to be quite gentle to my system. It's a lot softer um, and I can normally tolerate probably anywhere between, you know, let's call it 60 to 90 days before I start to feel like I need to like, have a bit of a, an, an off cycle. LSD, it's about 60 days. I find it's a lot more, uh, I find it has a little bit more of a caffeinated effect. And so I find after about 60 days, I start getting heart palpitations and yeah, I need to off, off cycle for about 90 days as well. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested. But one of the things that's led me to all the time, I don't know if you've been curious about it, is obviously in the late, I think it was the early, late 50s, early 60s when um, uh, the psych psychedelic network got shut down, uh, breath work started to become quite popular, especially in the academic field with holotropics, um, you know, as a form of, you know, simulating an activation of a psychedelic to create that altered state of consciousness without using the chem the chemicals it's themselves. I'm curious if you guys have been, you know, playing with breath work uh, methods, practice in the area of flow straight and activation? Uh, a little bit. Uh other people I know in, in the community have done way, way more work uh, than I than I have. I've done holotropic breath work. I don't, um, first of all, I am, uh, I am very suspicious of the claim that it can produce uh, LSD-like effects. What I have seen it do is get DMT style effects. Yeah, definitely. Right? That I've yeah. seen and, I, and I've had that experience. Um, in fact, doing holotropic breath work uh, in a, any kind of breath work in a sauna, um, can very easily produce that. Uh, I've, I've discovered, um, actually it was Laird Hamilton, the surfer who was the first person who told me about this. He yeah, was right. the first Laird, uh, Laird and I were, I don't know, it was a couple of years ago 
And he said to me, he said, he was telling me about the breath work stuff he was doing in his saunas. And he said, dude, we're, we're getting DMT like experience. I said, Larry, you, you know, I've actually done DMT. Like that means something, right? And he's like, no, no, really? And I was like, sure, Laird, DMT. Okay. And then I tried it. I was like, holy crap. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it works. Right. It worked. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, so, um, but I found it was like, you could get the fractalization and the fuzz out. I didn't find any of the, um, the more cognitive. Yeah. That stuff yeah. I didn't, I didn't get. I, so I got some of the fireworks um, and it certainly felt interesting. And I, I'm so I'm sure other people can get to other places. I never, I couldn't understand the LSD thing. Um, Cause I never saw anything melt or swirl yeah. or anything. Yeah, that, 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 bad frame for my part. Or, it's more the DMT. But I will say a lot of people say that like uh, in LSD to me, I laugh, like I giggle, I laugh and then things melt. Right. That's what that's what's LSD like. Right. The last time I took LSD, people do whatever. I went, I go skiing. <laughs> the last time I, went, I went skiing with a friend of mine. It was like five years ago. <laughs> we went, it's really strange to ski on asses. Especially if you ski wow. So in terms of where you're at now, like you've obviously been um, accumulating research for so long now that you literally do sit you know, right at the top as one of the probably the leading people when it comes to the public publication and the research. What are you starting to see now? Is it merely just refinements around the existing platform and the existing bed of knowledge that's already there? Or are you starting to see some significant innovations uh, in our no, understanding we're, yeah, of flow? We're, we're at the edge of um, a step function and change. So my organization, a uh, couple other organizations, uh, and we're going at it different ways, are sort of racing to, the, to develop a biophysical-based flow detector. So something yeah, that can okay. measure fit neurophysiological signals we are probably, um, and this is a miracle. I mean, you want to talk about the impossible becoming possible. Um, we are probably one to three years away from a, a, like version 1.0 of that device. And the fact that like that's a real thing is, is insane. That's going to be an enormous breakthrough. Uh, the flow trigger research, the neurobiology, what's the mechanism? Brand new. I mean, the past five years, brand new kind of thing. And that's the, that's a big lever, right? That's the lever that says you, so we have taken the flow research collective, um, a state, like if you look back in the 1990s, when people tried to train flow using the psychology, the hit rate wasn't good. Some, it was, it was really, it was 50, 50 wasn't even close to your odds. You just, you were more, more likely to get less flow in a sense. If you look at kind of it overall, we couldn't train it starting around. I think the first actual solid neurobiological research into flow started showing up in the late 1990s. So from then till now, because we figured out mechanism and understood triggers. Now, for example, if you take uh, zero to dangers, which is our flagship training of the flow research collective, and we measure flow pre and post, we're seeing a 70% boost on average on the backside. Flow is remarkably easy to train. And it's rem once you start with the neuroscience, so, We've identified 22 flow triggers. There are probably double that number, maybe even more. So once we start having a biophysical flow detector, suddenly the trip we can unlock a whole lot more there. And so that'll that, be a detector that you can wear, and it'll tell you where your biological state is at, effectively, or give you an indication. The the hesitation you, you're talking about something you can wear. I'm talking about something we can use in a laboratory. The gap <laughs> between, and, and, and yeah, I'm not saying it. that, right? Like, no, it's I get just it. how long until you can wear it? That could wearable be five tech. years. Yeah, yeah wearable yeah, tech yeah. on this level is probably five years out. Okay. Um, but I don't know. The EEG stuff is moving really fast. Like, stuff is moving very, very quickly. Um, it's a little hard to tell. Um, but we're definitely getting better and better and better at it. Um, so, no, I think we're on the... Cause, but we're starting to get the um, the really cutting edge uh, research right now is on functional connectivity, right? All how the brain's networks are interacting. Uh, the, we're the very front end of that work with most anything in the brain, but definitely with flow as well. We have some information, but that's just starting to happen. There's new technologies like uh, portable mag, which can give you full brain functional connectivity. Um, yeah right right those so that, that, that technology is like the god helmet this te this technology no, the god helmet still... the, the god helmet was a was a the inverse god helmet yeah. was pumping mag right uh, pump, this is 
you measuring with it, that was pumping electromagnetic oh, energy gotcha. in. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's almost the exact I inverse of, 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 well, of what Persinger was doing with that. And they tried to commercialize that. I met the guy. He lives in San Francisco. Who did, he, I think he called it the Shakti helmet, um, which is like the god. The, like the, you yeah. can order it online. I've never, I've never met anybody okay. who tried it. I've worn one of those um, and uh, got little tingles. It's an interesting device. I didn't have cosmic anything, but I'm other people did, and that's cool. I feel like you're missing out. I so, is there any that. other? Any other biotech that you're seeing coming through? Like in the in the, obviously wearables are about five years away, and like honestly, that's my dream because I I love to be able to measure performance, but use it as a conscious baseline to go, okay, right, this is what this feels like. And I remember when I you know there was a, a HRV monitor that was released like ten years ago, so I could actually try and get some measure of where my you know my stress was at in different scenarios, and I wore it around for three months, just going, oh, okay, I'm out of. I'm out of variability now. Okay, what's going on? Where am I at? And I found it super, super helpful to be able to yeah, just really biologically tune. We just did a, we being the Flow Research Collective, did a huge uh, podcast with uh, Don Moxley. I don't know. Have you ever met Don? You know this no. name? He's brilliant. Uh, he was, uh, he was a, he's sort of like the one of the gurus of HRV and, and performance. He's brilliant on HRV. And HRV is a phenomenal tool for measure and recovery. It may be a really good tool. We're looking at it really strongly for how does it correlate with flow. And right. we're doing a bunch of work there. Um, it's a really interest it's a really interesting metric. I'd be super surprised if there wasn't a massive correlation between that coherent state, that really coherent state and that flow. Obviously, depending on the what you're doing at the time. Um well, has, it's, has, has so it's, looked it, at it? it's yeah, it's it's interesting. Um we there's there's data that goes both ways so one right. of the things you have to know is that flow is sort of a stress condition so you see yep. cortisol go up and you see parasympathetic and sympathetic activation at once and usually when you get dual activation in those systems what it is is the body is trying to really fine tune something right when you get top down and bottom up and you can tune from both sides it's right. That's a really good metric for the body is really trying to dial in something very, very specific, which flow is. Um, so it's interesting. And I, I don't think the jury, I don't think we know yet, but certainly um, it's a great, you know, good variability is a great indicator of recovery. And as you know, you need an active or you need good recovery to, for a high flow lifestyle, right? Mm. We all know those. You, you certainly can get into flow on occasion if you're not recovered, but over time on a daily basis, kind of thing, it's not. You can't, and it's not sustainable, as you pointed out. Uh, Stephen, I literally want to keep talking to you for the next two hours, but out of respect for your time, I'm gonna I'm gonna start to wrap it up. But the the a couple of questions that I do have for you is uh, more about where people can find out because I know we've opened up some some big loops here. The twenty two triggers. Uh, the four stages uh, and the five chemicals. And so rather than us dump everything here, if someone was wanting to find where they could find those 22 triggers, like where would be the best piece of work? Yeah, yeah, book? You, well, uh, the triggers are, my book, Rise of Superman, breaks down all the neuro, you know, it's a, it's a fun book about what's been going on in action sports. That's my book about what was going on in action sports. But uh, it's it's sort of the fundamental primer on flow and i break down all 22 of those triggers you go to the flow research collective.com the website there's tons of free everything on there um the other thing is uh for your listeners i don't know if rian told you about this but if you go to flow research collective.com forward slash flow blocker um that's a free diagnostic for anyone and all it does is sort of overuse your your life and basically says this is the thing that's standing between you and way more flow so that's yeah, useful right. too Oh, fantastic. So we'll put all of those links on there and you guys can go there and find <clears throat> where the, the 22 triggers, the four stages of flow. But mate, <clears throat> answer this one for me. What are those five chemicals that uh, that actually uplift in the flow state? Those five, uh, or, I think it's it's five, it's, it's five or six. Um, and the, so there's way more involved. We know, yeah, right. That, right? We're but, opening up Pandora's box. But uh, no, uh, uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, anandamide, and endorphins and possibly oxytocin. It's, it seems very clear that oxytocin 
shows up in all the in group flow, which is the team collective shared version of flow state, yeah, right? right? It's, a, it's a team performing at their best. Paul Zach, who's sort of the, the god of oxytocin, neuroscientist. Um, Paul, uh, and, I, and I like Paul a great deal, and I think he's really smart. Paul is really convinced that oxytocin shows up in individual flow, and I just haven't seen really convincing data one way or another. I hear his argument, and I understand the science behind it, and it makes sense, but until I can sort of see it in an experiment that I can point at and be comfortable with, I can't say it for sure. But we also know like acetylcholine, which is your brain yep. awake and alert, right? Of course, that's involved in flow because you've got attention in the present moment, but it's not one of the chemicals we measure when we talk about flow. But that's what I mean by it's like Pandora's box. When we talk about the core, the big five or the big six, it's those. Those are all the pleasure drugs also. That's the other point is those are all the brain's principal pleasure drugs. They're all the things that make us feel good, right? If you... We've been talking about norepinephrine and dopamine all day. If I put those two things together and I put them in your system, I've just given you the cocktail that is romantic love, right? That's what romantic, that's why it feels so good. So I always tell people flow is romantic love plus three other chemicals. <laughs> right? Let's go. So mate, I know you're constantly producing content articles, but have we got any new books to keep a, an eye out for? Yeah, the, I, well, we just, and the, it, you know, it, it's, I think it's a great off topic. We didn't really spend much time on the disruptive technology side of the, the equation, right? Um, I always tell people whenever the impossible becomes possible, you tend to see two things, right? You see people in flow leveraging some kind of new accelerating disruptive technology that tends to be the combination that produces the impossible more than anything else. Mm. Um, so yeah. I work on the other side of the equation as well. And I have a new book with Peter Diamandis, who's the founder of the X prize and singularity university. Um, we, that came out in January called the future is faster than you think. And it talks about what happens when 10 or 12 massively accelerating technologies start crashing into each other, which is what's going on in the world today. And it's a pretty good frame for kind of looking at a, at, at a, you know, I think most people got introduced to exponential technology or exponentials through COVID because they finally, oh, that's what it looks like when things get go exponential. Yes. And that's happening in technology now too, not just in viruses. Yeah, um, right. <clears throat> right. And so um, that is brand new uh, that, that came out in January. And what, what's that called? Disruptive, disruptive the technology. It's called The Future is Faster Than You Think. Oh, The Future is Faster Than You Think. Fantastic. Well, mate, uh, hopefully we can get you back on here there in the go. future. And we can, there we oh, go. Fantastic. There we go. Well, Body I'm hoping 17,000 can... copies. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. It'll help you lose weight. It'll... Uh... Well, mate, um, I would love to get you back on here again to interview you more about uh, disruptive technologies in that book, but also would love to get you at some point to speak for our, our business community when we uh, we bring our K2 elites over. In the, I know we've tried to get you a couple of times, but you're a very, very busy man. Uh, but until then, mate, thank you so much. This has been a real honor and a pleasure, and I hope we get to connect in the flesh at some point in the future. My pleasure. Thanks for laughing with me <laughs> along the way. That was fun. Dude, that was awesome, man. I, I had such that. fun. Good. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you, buddy. Have a good one. This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you get to see all of these interviews in the flesh. Share this podcast with your friends and drop me a review on iTunes. I would love to hear what you guys think and also let you know that your comments help make sure that we keep producing killer content just like this. And if you'd like to stay up to date with all of my movements, upcoming podcasts, events, and much more, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com, and also check us out on all social media on the handle at Kerwin Ray. Thanks for joining us.